So as Prasad said, I, I uh, began my uh, career as a physicist. I uh, have a doctorate from the University of Oxford in England, which is where I come from originally. And I used to work at the High Energy Physics Laboratory CERN in Switzerland. Uh, but after about five years of research, I made a switch into, uh, into financial markets. But the, um, my interest in physics and a scientific approach to things persisted with me ever since, and certainly through my career as, uh, as a trader. I, after I left CERN, I joined Goldman Sachs in London as a trader, and traded for about nine years before becoming a risk manager, moving from the first to the second lines of defense, although that, that language wasn't, didn't exist at that time. Um, my talk's going to be a bit different from the others that you heard yesterday and this morning, uh, but I hope that you'll find it insightful and thought-provoking. I'm going to begin by uh, talking about complex adaptive systems and the, re the, the reason why it'll become apparent shortly. So Wikipedia defines complex adaptive systems as a system that is complex, well, that's helpful, uh, in that it is a dynamic network of interactions. The behavior of the ensemble may not be predictable according to behavior of the components. It's adaptive in the individual and collective behavior mutate and self-organize over time, corresponding to change initiating micro-events or collection of events. The, the definition goes on. I don't think I need to say any more. The, uh, the, the, the fact is these complex adaptive systems, we, we, we're used to simple linear systems with a, a linear response function. You, you have a model of something, you change one of the inputs by a small amount, the output changes by a small amount proportional to the, the size of the input change. Complex adaptive systems don't work like that. Small change in the inputs can lead to a much magnified uh, difference in the outputs because they, op they, they obey power laws. So we're in the realms of chaos theory and the idea of the butterfly flapping its wings in the Philippines uh, causing a hurricane to develop over the, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the uh, the deep interconnection between different components of the system mean that classic techniques of solving complicated problems, the techniques of the Stoic philosophers of taking a, a complicated problem and dividing it into its component parts, having experts solve each of the components and then reconstituting the whole to give the, the, the whole answer, that technique will work for problems which are complicated but it will not work for problems which are complex because of these deep interconnections. And um, the, the reason I'm talking about this is because financial markets, which is where I spent the bulk of my career and what a lot of many of you are involved in, financial markets are examples of complex adaptive systems. Now, at the time of the, the global financial crisis about 15 years ago, there was uh, talk a lot of politicians compared financial markets to gambling in a casino. And bankers were referred to as, you know, these bankers are uh, gambling with depositors, um, with the deposits of depositors and investing them, you know, speculating in ridiculous uh, investments and lo losing all this money. But the conflation of a financial market with gambling on a in a casino or on a horse race, that elides a fundamental distinction between the two. The reason is that if you're betting on a horse race, uh, if, if lots of people think that a particular horse is favored to win, the bookmakers will shorten the odds of that horse, it'll become the favorite, they'll lengthen the odds on the other horses to try to attract people to bet on those instead. All this action in the betting market changes the odds of which horse is favored to win, but in the end, at the end of the day, the race is won by the fastest horse on the day. It's got nothing to do with the betting market. There's complete independence between the betting market on the one hand and the event, which horse wins the race, or how the dice land on the craps table, or the turn of a card, or the, you know, the fall of the ball on the roulette wheel. There's complete independence between the betting market and the event. And that's like the world of classical physics or classical Newtonian mechanics where there's independence between observer and observed. Financial markets are much more like the world of quantum mechanics, however. Some of you who've studied some physics may remember that in the world of quantum mechanics, this, the, the systems that you're looking at are so small 
that the actions of observing the system interfere with the system and change it. It's described by something called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and it sets a fundamental limit on the degree of precision with which you can know both the position and the momentum of a particle like an electron or a quark. And um, th that limit is given by, given by something called Planck's constant, Max Planck being one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics in the early 20th century. But this interaction between observer and observed is exactly what happens in a financial market. If people think that a particular stock price is going to go up because the company's performing well or whatever, they buy that stock in anticipation of a price rise, but it, it's their action of buying the stock that pushes the price up. There's no independence between the betting market and the result of the event. They're one and the same thing because the, 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 the stock price goes up because of demand from people who think it's going to go up, so they buy it, so that pushes the stock price up. And this interaction between observer and observed in the case of financial markets is why uh, it's what George Soros, uh, a great hedge fund investor, refers to as reflexivity. And reflexivity is the reason why financial markets are adaptive. That's why they're complex and adaptive. And um, financial markets are not the only example. In any system where you've got ind independently acting uh, units like human beings, human, hu systems of human interactions are examples of complex adaptive systems. And it's particularly problematic because over the last few years, there have been simultaneous crises in four different complex adaptive systems. And they hear what I call the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and it gives the title of this talk, The, the Interconnected Crisis Between the political, political System, Our Economic Framework, the Coronavirus Pandemic, and Global Climate Change. And not only are is, each of these is a complex adaptive system in itself, but not only are there deep interconnections within each system, there are deep interconnections and interactions between the systems. So a classic example is that of the coronavirus pandemic and our economy. In the early days of the pandemic, before uh, vaccines were widely available, the medical experts are saying, oh, you've got to um, sob interactions, everybody should wear masks, stay at home, don't go out, don't go out to restaurants, don't go out to shops, you know, uh, football matches, things like that, cancel all those to stop interactions, to stop the progression of the disease. The economists, on the other hand, were saying, oh, you can't do that. If you stop people going out, if you lock down the economy, that'll be disastrous for the economy. So this kind of interaction where experts advising one thing in their field of expertise, the medical professionals, in the case of the, the pandemic, that is working exactly against what experts in an, another field, in this case the economy, uh, would, would have. Another example is that between global climate change and the economic system. So you have people like Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of Canada, then he became governor of the Bank of England. Uh, Mark Carney now has been agitating, been advocating uh, that banks should withdraw capital funding for carbon extractive industries like the oil industry and the coal industry and things like that in order to reduce the impact of man-made climate change, re reduce the impact of you know, future emissions of carbon dioxide to help the issue of, the, of global climate change. But I don't have a chart of it here, I should have put one in, but um, renewable energy is a tiny proportion of the total energy consumption of the world today. The overwhelming majority of, of energy production comes from still from coal and oil and these carbon intensive uh, industries. And if we, if we accelerated the, um, what Mark Carney's trying to do, withdrawing capital from these carbon-based carbon energy systems, there simply isn't enough renewable energy available to support the rest of the economy. So if everybody in the United States decided we're going to get rid of our uh, internal combustion engine car, we're going to buy a Tesla, the American power system simply could not provide enough electric power to drive all those cars. And note that the the impact of this is going to land most heavily on the poorest people. 
because they're, they're the people who are less able to buy expensive Teslas and things like that. And that relates to the, the fourth interaction, which is that between the, the economic system and the political system. Because in the time since the global financial crisis 15 years ago, there has been a loss of faith in democracy, a loss of faith in the political system, a loss of political legitimacy. You see that in things like the increased polarization in the United States. It's not just a US phenomenon. The same thing happens in the United Kingdom, where you know, the Brexit vote in 2016, ostensibly Brexit was about England taking back control from Brussels. In reality, it was nothing to do with that. It was the, the English regions. So post-industrial cities like Stoke-on-Trent, which was the city where I was born, it's the poorest city in the whole of Europe. It used to be the center of the potteries industry. As a result of globalization, that got, all, all got, that got transferred to, to China, where the, where the labor was much cheaper. Uh, so cities like Stoke-on-Trent, Sunderland in the northeast, used to be the center of shipbuilding. All the shipbuilding, there's no shipbuilding in the UK anymore. That all happens in places like South Korea. So there's elements of globalization, the global financial crisis, the, the political and regulatory response to the global financial crisis, like the Fed cutting rates in order to boost asset prices, that benefited people who were already long assets. They're already wealthy. It didn't really help Joe Sixpack and Jane Doe, who lost their jobs in the financial crisis. So the political crisis, increasing polarization, is deeply interconnected with the, the effects on the economy. So all of these problems are interrelated, interrelated and they all need to be solved together. Um, we talk, talk, speak of ourselves as risk managers, and risk is classically uh, defined as the volatility of returns. Um, but really, we don't really care about volatility of returns on the upside, making profits. That's not really what we're worried about. We're worried about volatility on the downside and making losses. And um, a, a more useful definition, I think, is that given by the economist Frank Knight, who describes the difference between risk and uncertainty. Risk, he says, is the potential for uh, adverse outcome comes drawn from a distribution which is known. Uncertainty is the potential for adverse outcomes drawn from a distribution which is not known. Um, this is like, I don't know if you remember the uh, former uh, US uh, Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, now, dead now, but he was the Defense Secretary under George W. Bush. And he talked about the difference between known unknowns and unknown unknowns. He, he said, there are known knowns. There are things that we know that we know. And there are known unknowns, things that we know that we don't know. But the most dangerous things of all are the unknown unknowns, the things that we don't know that we don't know. The things that Rumsfeld were talking about there, the unknown unknowns, are uncertainties. They're what Nicholas Nassim Taleb refers to as black swan events. And as risk managers, that's the thing, those are the things that we should worry about the most. Really, we should call ourselves not risk managers, but uncertainty managers, because that's really the nature of the beast that we're dealing with. Now, um, when, I, when I started out in, in financial markets 35 years ago or so, risk management as a discipline didn't exist. Remember that the Basel Committee in banking was set up only in 1974 under, it was under the chairmanship of Peter Cook, who was a representative of the Bank of England. They came up with a Cook ratio to hold a minimum capital requirement for loans, 8% of the uh, notional value of the loan held as capital. Uh, that, that was the center of the, the first Basel, the original Basel Accord in 1988. And then uh, Dennis Weatherson, who was the chairman of JP Morgan, he used to chair a daily treasury committee at 4.15. And they had a report produced for them, the 4.15 report. And Weatherson got fed up of seeing all of these market risk exposures put before him. He had, had uh, 10 year equivalents, futures equivalent for short rate futures contract, interest rate contracts, net open position for foreign exchange. So this is all hopeless. All these different numbers. How do, how do I think about all of these together? And so JP Morgan Quants came up with the idea of 
value at risk, a statistical method of aggregating disparate risk types into a single number. And so it was born VAR in the 415 report. Uh, JP Morgan pushed the idea to its clients, and they then put it in a separate system, which they spun off, that's risk metrics. And the Basel Committee picked this up as an idea for banks. Sophisticated banks could use their internal models, their VAR model, now, now replaced by expected shortfall models, in the, in capital, in the, in the capital underpinning of the 1996 amendment of the original Basel Accord. And then, of course, in, from January the 1st, 2008, we had Basel II uh, arriving just in time to experience spectacular failure in the global financial crisis later that year. So, the note that the, the very idea that the Basel Committee has of the pillar one risk-weighted asset calculations for capital underpinning, a piece for credit risk, a piece for market risk, and a piece for operational risk. Then you aggregate these and assume that that generates a prudent level of capital, capital underpinning for a bank. It's, it's a flawed assumption, the reasons I've already explained. This, this division, this compartmentalization of risk is simply flawed. Now, it, it's most of the time, it's not too bad a representation, but then most of the time, banks don't need capital uh, because they, they have sufficient earnings from their regular activities. Their earnings can absorb normal kind of day-to-day -day losses. Banks only need capital during extremely stressful situations, extreme market stress, stock market collapse, a huge loan default or whatever. That's when a bank needs capital. But that's the very time when these models fail most egregiously, which is why I describe them as like umbrellas that work beautifully, but only whilst the sun shines. In other words, for the, for the reason that they're intended, they're completely useless. And that's, um, that's a big problem. Um, as I said, when I, when I started out in the industry, risk management as a discipline didn't exist. It's something that's grown up, being built up over the last 35 years or so. And um, when I was a trade, when I started on the trading floor, compliance was what you expected from your girlfriend. Trading floors were much more sexist places to then than they are today. So the, all of these concepts have been developed in the course of my uh, career. I had involvement in some, of, in some of that. But my point here, you may be, on listening to me, you may be thinking, oh my God, this is all hopeless. He's telling us all these models we've got are useless and the foundations, the theoretical foundations, the underpinning of everything that we do, it's, it's just sand, the whole edifice is gonna come crashing down around our heads. No, no, that's, that's not a sensible way to go. The, the, the models that you have, the models that you use are useful. My point is, you need to be very, very careful about how you use them. You can't unthinkingly take the outputs of models and just use them. You need to have a full holistic view of the portfolios of exposures that you have, the companies, the company that you're, that you're working for, you need to recognize that for all of the, the scientific and theoretical uh, edifice that is now risk management and governance and compliance, uh, for all of that, risk management forever will remain as much an art as it is a science. And if you don't remember that, and you, if you forget the assumptions underlying the models that were created, if you view risk narrowly, this, this, is my, this is what I do, I do a operational risk or I do market risk and I'm just gonna stick to my knitting and focus on that. If you do that, then you are setting up the company that you're working for, you're trying to protect, you're setting up your company to be doomed to fail. And that's uh, a rather apt introduction to my final slide. This is a, a book which I've written, it's, uh, not quite available yet. Uh, the, the website's up and running, make pre-orders. The e-book and the uh, audio book will be available next month. The, the hard, hardback physical book will be available in August. But in this book, I expand greatly on all, on all of these, these points that I've, that I've made. I talk about why democracy is the best form of political organization and why other forms like autocracies, oligarchies, uh, will lead their, their populations, they'll, they'll repress their populations and start, wage war on their neighbors, much more likely to do that than you are in a democracy. I explain why capitalism is the best form of economic organization for a country, 
and why Marxism and communism, things like that, are destined to fail, and why in democratic countries whose governments adopt industrial policies, those policies are doomed to fail and they should, they should not be done. And explain why the underlying dynamic which results in uh, democracy being the best form of political organization and capitalism being the best form of economic organization, they share a, a common under, underlying dynamic with Darwinian, Darwinian evolution and the evolution of life on Earth. So that's a very f profound, fundamental thing, I think. I explain why um, diversity is so important in any organization that wants to be re robust and resilient all the way from the ordinary rank and file employees, the executive suite, the board of directors. You need diversity in order to be able to make your organization as robust uh, and resilient as, as possible. I then go on to talk about the central banks and their role in running monetary policy, and in particular the Federal Reserve. And the failures of the Federal Reserve to manage monetary policy effectively is what gave rise to the global financial crisis 15 years ago. The history of the Fed is one of the Fed cleaning up messes of its own creation. I then go on to talk about uh, regulation, bank regulation, central bank's role in regulation and the Basel Committee, and why, uh, as well-intentioned as the central banks were, and the politicians, the Dodd-Frank laws brought in after the crisis 15 years ago, they were well-intentioned, but they were fundamentally misguided and has made the system far more fragile and likely to fail, as we duly saw earlier this year with Silicon Valley Bank, uh, First Republic Bank, and uh, Credit Suisse in, uh, in Switzerland. And uh, you, might, you might have wondered, why was it that uh, the, 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 the roots of the global financial crisis occurred in the United States. It was a homegrown issue in the United States. Bad lending decisions on mortgages backing residential real estate. The crisis was wholly homegrown in the United States. And then its impacts were even greater. Yes, in the States we had Lehman's failure and so on, but in, in Europe the effects were even bigger. You had bank failures in Europe, you had Northern Rock Building Society, equivalent of a UK, uh, US SNL, savings and loan in England, failed. You had UBS, a bank that I then went to work for, uh, which lost its entire equity capital base, 50 billion Swiss francs. Uh, you had the, uh, what's called the, the sovereign debt crisis and the Eurozone crisis in Europe in 2012. This was all the aftermath of the global financial crisis, which had much worse impacts in Europe than it did in the United States. Now, given that the, the origins of the crisis were in the United States, why did it affect, impact Europe so badly? That's a result of regulation, as I explained in the book. And um, the, fi the final chapter of the book is, uh, ha is how to do things better, how I think things should be set up better. Uh, and how re bank regulation should be done in a way which is much better, and how monetary policy should be done in a way which is much better. So if any of those things interest you, then those things are discussed in, in great detail in the book, and I would thoroughly recommend it to you. But with that, I'll say thank you very much indeed for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I did not mention early when I introduced Paul, I had the... Uh, uh, pleasure, opportunity, and privilege to work with Paul at Lehman. And I learned so much from Paul about risk management and market risk management, credit risk management, and operational risk, and how they're all interconnected. There's nobody better than Paul to answer any of your questions about governance, risk, and compliance, in my view. Such a brilliant uh, fellow and, and, and a very diverse background uh, from uh, uh, physics to physicists to trading to risk management to onto the great things he does. Please feel free to ask Paul any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Prasad. Any questions for Paul? Yeah. I think that we're probably done for now. I think that the, 
the particular failings at, like, for example, Silicon Valley Bank and some of the others were, um, were quite unique to those. There's no question that at those banks, in risk management within the banks was, was very badly done. And supervision from the San Francisco Fed was very badly done. But one thing is important to note, after the global financial crisis, one of the takeaways from the Dodd-Frank Act was banks should stop um, investing depositors' money in risky investment, high-yield investments, risky corporate loans. Instead, they should invest far more in liquid government bonds. And things like the, um, the Volcker Rule prevented banks from doing proprietary trading across the board everywhere except U.S. Treasuries. They were allowed to continue to do proprietary trading in U.S. Treasuries, but nowhere else. So what do banks like Silicon Valley Bank, what do they do? They're told that you can't invest in loans, you can invest in treasuries, so they invested lots of treasuries. And what happens? And the, and the Fed said, we're going to keep rates low for a long period of time. So naive management at Silicon Valley Bank's uh, bought all these long-dated treasuries with low coupons. They were the coupons extant at the time, but low coupons. Then, of course, the Fed reneges on it, but loses, loses control of inflation completely starts to jack up rates, the fastest series of rate rises ever, probably, certainly since the Second World War. And uh, so Silicon Valley Bank suffers huge mark-to-market losses on its treasury portfolio, except the fact they're held in a held-to-maturity portfolio. But the whole street, you know, even, even if you are a hold-to-maturity or available for sale uh, finan uh, accounting uh, practice, even if you don't mark your positions to market, like the investment banks did, uh, the street, you know, the street investors, they mark, mark your book to market whether you do or not. So they have huge mark to market losses on these held, uh, held to maturity treasuries and a, a run on the, uh, you know, a, a run on uh, depositors sh shifting their money out after they recorded in their, in their uh, financial statements, they recorded these uh, not realized mark to market losses on their held to maturity portfolios. But this, this whole crisis was invented by the Fed, uh, or invented by the Dodd-Frank Act and, and, the, and the, the political and regulatory response to the crisis, telling, you know, forcing banks away from investing in risky investments, which could actually help the economy, and instead directing banks to invest in U.S. Treasuries. Then, of course, it's the U.S. Treasuries that blows them up. I mean, it, it, this, if it weren't so tragic, it would be funny. The, the incompetence of the Fed would be funny if it weren't so tragic. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed.